Okay, well welcome to a very small faith cafe. <laughs> really glad to have you all here. Um, this is the first in a four week series um, that's really looking into the Confession of Belhar, um, which is a confession that was adopted by PCUSA into the Book of Confessions uh, just a year and a half ago. Um, and so, and although we've learned, I hadn't heard of it before, but learned that it's something that Glenn had actually used quite a bit. And so it's something I think we have heard in our services, um, though not, not, at least I didn't know that that's what I was hearing. Um, for, for years. So this is the first in the four-part series. We'll have, I'll go over the, the rest of it at the end, what, you're, what we have coming in the next three weeks. Um, I think it's actually, it's a really lovely confession, so I think it, it, will, it will be fun to explore it. So, next slide. Um, so as I already said, it was adopted by um, the 222nd General Assembly of PCUSA in 2016. Um, it, this was a confession that was developed um, in South Africa in apartheid as a reaction to and as a way that the church was standing against apartheid. Um, and it was written in 1982 and is adopted by the Dutch Reformed Mission Church in 1986. And I'll talk more about that, what that church was, um, and sort of why they felt the need to speak out um, about this later on. But what this foundation, what the confession does is it really provides a theological foundation for standing against in particular apartheid, but I think you'll hopefully come to read it, it um, is the foundation for standing against many, many, many different kinds of injustice um, in the world. And it really is centered on three themes, unity, reconciliation, and justice. Um, and each of the, the following weeks is going to look at one of those themes in greater depth, greater depth. So the Confession of Belhar came out of a very particular historical context. Um, so it's, in one way, it is a unique product of that system, system of apartheid in South Africa. Um, as I said, I think it's the, what it, it, the conclusions it draws are much more broadly applicable. Um, so I'm sure everyone knows at least something about apartheid. Apartheid was literally apartness, apart, apartheid, um, separation by races um, in South Africa. And it began very early in colonization of South Africa by the Dutch and also by the British. Um, began back in the um, early 1800s, and in the 20th century, it was institutionalized, made very rigid, enforced by law, um, or encoded in the law, enforced by the police and the military, very brutally. It was in place from, formal apartheid was in, in place from 1948 to 1994, um, and our, the, our Book of Confession says it was established by law and enforced <coughs> through, through violence, so many people died under apartheid um, and because of apartheid. And the church, churches played a very large and often kind of horrific role in establishing and codifying apartheid. Um, they were complicit in development, and some of them um, may not have agreed with it, but weren't actively fighting it until late um, in the time. So looking at the Dutch church in particular, which I believe was the main church, I'm not actually totally sure, but I believe it was the main church in South Africa. Uh, the Dutch church, um, in the 1820s, um, some Dutch settlers came, came and asked to be separated from uh, black South Africans um, in their worship and in their buildings, and the church said, no, you can't. That's not Christian. Christian, we're, we're together in one community. Um, a few decades later, they yielded to the pressure and they said, okay, it's, it's allowable to be separate, to have separate uh, church services, separate facilities. Um, we're not requiring it. But then a while later, they said, okay, yeah, we're requiring it. You are mandated to be separate. Um, and they actually established, um, when, when formal apartheid came about in South Africa, you know, across the entire country, the Dutch church um, had established four separate churches. There are three mission churches, and then the one main Dutch, Dutch Reformed church, which was the white church. So there's the white church, there's the black church, there's a the colored church, which is mixed race, and there's the Indian church. Um, and then they took it a step farther and they developed a theology of apartheid that said that not only required separation by race, but it actually said this is God's will. God's will for South Africa is that the races be separate from each other. This is not a good chapter in the church's history. Um, next slide. And uh, Desmond Tutu's um, church was the Episcopal Church. And they were, I kind of referenced them early, a bit earlier, they were opposed to apartheid in principle, but they were not fighting it actively. So I feel like this is the stage in which I think a lot of us find ourselves in the societies. We don't agree with a lot of what's happening, but 
we're not actually out there speaking against it. We don't, maybe we don't know how to, we don't feel empowered to, we're scared to, whatever. Um, and they did actually have separate churches because, again, that was the way the culture was, and so they, they were following that part of the culture. Um, and then, like I said, the, the confession was written in the 80s, um, so it's instructed to look at what was actually happening in particular in the 1980s in South Africa. And it was a very grim time. The apartheid regime, um, first of all, they, they were under pressure. And there, this was a time when churches were starting to speak out and starting to act more against apartheid. There was more resistance within the culture. Um, other countries were putting pressure on. And as a result, the apartheid state declared um, two state of emergencies, which gave blanket immunity to the police and the army. Resulted in 40,000 people detained, 40% of them children. I'm assuming it's teenagers, um, but 40%, you know, so we're looking at 18,000 children detained. Um, there's routine targeting and torture of activists, political assassinations. Biko, Stephen Biko being probably the most famous of those. Uh, actually, Stephen Biko's uh, son um, lived here for, for a while. In Madison? In Madison, oh, yes. Okay. Actually, uh, he went to uh, Winthrop hmm. Elementary, and he and I was in, in the same class. Oh, really? Well, wow. yeah. Yeah, so has a long reach this um, stuff. And there's almost daily killing of protesters when they spoke out against this. Um, and that's the context in which, which the confession was developed. It was developed by the Dutch Reformed Mission Church, which was the colored and multiracial church, um, in 1982 to 1986. And the core of the confession is that by our faith, because of our faith, because we are Christians, we are obligated. We don't just have the choice. We are obligated to work for unity, reconciliation, and justice. And we are obligated to act on that, not just to think, oh, in my heart, I don't, I don't like this, but to really um, act to, to change things. So um, this, these are words from Alan Aubrey Bosak. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right. But there's this really nice Lenten Reflections on the Confession of Belhar um, that was put out last year by PCUSA. A bunch of different, um, I believe, pastors um, meditating in different aspects of of Belhar, and he, um, I think is from South Africa and is part of this movement, and he said that as Christians we are obligated, not just to work for unity, but to do so joyfully. Because we're Christians, we're uh, obligated to give ourselves willingly and joyfully to one another. That's part of what it is to be Christian. Um, same thing with reconciliation. It's an obligation for us. It's not an option. It's not an option to be like, to weigh carefully. I don't know, does it make sense to do that? Um, okay, maybe, you know, on balance, I should do that. No, no, it's like, no, it's our obligation as Christians to reconcile with one, another's, with one another. And that justice is the heart of Christian discipleship. It's really, it's the key of what it means to follow Christ. And to, to um, touch a little more on that last part, he talks about, this is kind of like his logic um, following from, from um, theology is that, that the God of Jesus, the God of Jesus of Nazareth is a God of justice. God calls the church to follow God in that. And then the church must therefore stand by all people in any form of suffering and need, which means that the church must witness against any form of injustice. And finally, the church is the possession of God. And uh, these little dot, dot, dots, that was him sort of talking about what we're not. So we're the possession of God, we're not the possession of people who want separation and the, the political leaders and you know, all of that. So the church is a possession of God to stand where God stands, which is against just injustice and the wronged. Next slide. So if you look at the structure, so there are handouts of the confession over by the entryway, and if you didn't get one, I'd encourage you to go get one. We're going, going to um, listen to a video that PCUSA put out of people reading the confession. Um, and I want to kind of let you know what the structure is so that you can listen for the different pieces. Um, and so it starts with the call, call of confession, which is fairly short. Um, we're basically talking about we believe in the triune God. Um, and then there's a call to unity, a call to reconciliation, a call to justice, and then it ends with a call to act, which is also shorter. But it really is descending out. And, it, um, and next slide. The, the meat of the confession, the bulk of it is in the call to unity, reconciliation, and justice. And the form of these, the, each of these sections, including the first and last, start with we believe. Um, and the version I have actually has links to a bunch of different um, biblical verses that, that back that up, as sort of the origin of the text. 
Um, then when you get to the call to unity, reconciliation, and justice, it talks about we believe this and this and this and this. Therefore, we reject any ideology or any um, doctrine which does this, this, this. So it's sort of, this is what we believe, and this is what we're going to do about it, or this is sort of what we're, what we're standing against because of our beliefs. Um, and next slide. And I want to stress again this call to action. Um, the core idea is that it's not enough to just believe in your heart that something's wrong. We're called to, to act on it. Okay, so let's see this video. And the, um, the statements are a little funny, so we're going to... Um, hold on, Mike. It's projecting through... The, proje the sound is going through the projector, so we'll hold a, bit, a mic up to that. Yeah, so I don't know. The Confession of Bel Mar is a powerful confession of Christian faith that emerged in South Africa during the years of government imposed racial segregation known as apartheid. The major themes of the Confession of Bel Mar are unity is both a gift given by God and an obligation of the Church of Jesus Christ. The Church of Jesus Christ must stand with people who suffer any form of oppression and injustice. Reconciliation and justice of God are central to the life of the Church of Jesus Christ. The Presbyterian Church USA Book of Confessions reminds us that confessions address the issues, problems, dangers and opportunities of a given historical situation. Many in the Presbyterian Church USA have claimed the Confession of Belmar not only for its courage voiced from a church and people suffering over two centuries of oppression and injustice, but also for the ways it speaks to our 21st century American Presbyterian context that is struggling with division and the ongoing wounds of segregation and the racism. We believe the Confession of Belmar speaks to the Presbyterian Church USA. We believe the Confession of Belmar is our confession today. We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers, protects, and cares for the church through word and spirit. This God has done since the beginning of the world and will do to the end. We believe in one holy, universal Christian church, the communion of saints called from the entire human family. We believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as the community of believers who have been reconciled with God and with one another. That unity is therefore both a gift and an obligation for the church of Jesus Christ. That through the working of God's Spirit, it is a binding force, yet simultaneously a reality which must be earnestly pursued and sought, one which the people of God must continually be built up to attain. But this unity must become visible so that the world may believe that separation, enmity, and hatred between people is sin, which Christ has already conquered. And accordingly, that anything which threatens this unity may have no place in the church and must be resisted. But this unity of the people of God must be manifested and be active in a variety of ways. And that we love one another. That we experience, practice, and pursue community with one another. That we are obligated to give ourselves willingly and joyfully to be a benefit and blessing to one another. That we share one faith have one calling, are of one soul, and one mind. Have one God and Father, are filled with one spirit, are baptized with one baptism, eat of one bread, and drink of one cup. Confess one day, are obedient to one Lord, work for one cause, and share one hope. Together, Come to know the height and the breadth and the depth of the love of Christ. Together are built up to the stature of Christ, to the new humanity. Together know and bear one another's burdens. 
thereby fulfilling the law of Christ, that we need one another and upbuild one another, admonishing and comforting one another, that we suffer with one another for the sake of righteousness, crying together, together serve God in this world, and together fight against all which may threaten or hinder this unity. That this unity can be established only in freedom and not under constraint. That the variety of spiritual gifts, opportunities, backgrounds, convictions, as well as the various languages and cultures, are by virtue of the reconciliation of Christ, opportunities for mutual service and enrichment within the one visible people of God.
that the church as the possession of God must stand where the Lord stands, namely against injustice and wicked wrong. That in following Christ, the church must witness against all the powerful and privileged who selfishly seek their own interests and thus control and harm others. Therefore, we reject any ideology which would legitimate forms of injustice and any doctrine which is unwilling to resist such an ideology in the name of the gospel. We believe that in obedience to Jesus Christ, its only head, the church is called to confess and do all these things, even though the authorities and human laws might forbid them, and punishment and suffering be the consequence. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. to the one and only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the honor and the glory forever and ever. out to you. Nothing? I think there are definitely things that are very much rooted in the context. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the statements were specifically uh, regarding forced separation um, in, in the very unique situation of apartheid, but then there were a lot of things that really transcend the context and, and really reach beyond that particular issue. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, this does kind of apply. I don't know who said the most segregated hour in America is like Sunday between like 10 to 11, right now. something like that. And I really liked how, I mean, it used like the words, like it, 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 anything that anything that does separate is ideology and false doctrine. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I mean that 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 struck out uh, uh, out and basically um, um, the only way to beat bad theology is through good theology, mm -hmm. and this is good theology. I agree. I was thirty years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't believe that current. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very, very relevant. Yeah, which is interesting kind of and some of the next slides talk about like why why was it adopted now here in this country? Because it's I mean it, it was yeah, thirty years old, but um I mean it was adopted by PC USA thirty years after um it was written. So what year I'm trying to remember what year exactly did we adopt this? Twenty sixteen. Wow. Just a year and a half ago, yeah. The, it, it, the church was looking at it for a very long time. Um, I think the, the first, um, I think in 2004 was I think when the General Assembly recommended that um, churches start studying this, and then they voted in 2016, so. Lightning, and I think it's been about like, the same time. time. Like, <laughs> yeah. We're Presbyterians, yeah. <laughs> Anything else um, anyone noticed? Okay. It implied that there was a church in South Africa that was against this. Um, so that the, the church didn't know about that. Yes, yeah, and there were, um, I think I, last night I realized I hadn't, I meant to put ad slides on that and I didn't. Um, um, the, and I don't, I don't know a ton about this, but I know that, that I think in the 80s and probably earlier, the churches started speaking more and more about, about this. And I think um, there was something in a study guide, a Presbyterian study guide um, I read that was talking about um, the church, church is clearly complicit, but it also helped bring about the end of apartheid. Um, as people would read the Bible, and it pretty clearly <laughs> supports um, fighting for justice in this case, and you know is pretty clearly against this kind of separation. And so that did, um, that did come to bear in the church that speak out. I don't know a ton about that. Okay, next slide then. Um, so, as I said, it was adopted by PCUSA in 2016, 30 years after um, it was adopted by the Dutch Reform Mission. We already addressed this, but why this confession and why now? And you guys already have already hit on some of the reasons. It's very relevant. The Book of Confessions says that the, the, so the committee that recommended that the church study this, again, back in 2004, 
They believe that the clarity of Bellhar's witness to unity, reconciliation, and justice might help PCUSA speak and act with similar clarity at a time when it faces division, racism, and injustice, generally. So next slide. Um, there were also kind of three main reasons that PCUSA took this on. First of all, the Reformed Church in America, which is one of our partner uh, churches, was looking at this as well, so it's a way for us to build more connection with them. But the more important reasons are, um, first of all, the focus on unity. There are forces that are tearing, that are tearing the Presbyterian Church apart. And so I think that was one reason is that um, really he and the scriptural basis of the need for unity could help the church um, build more um, stronger internal connections. Um, but the primary reason was because of racism. And just it's such a long, long pro standing problem in this country. Um, and so that because of the enduring problem of racism in our culture, the 216th General Assembly asked the Presbyterian Church of the USA to consider how the Confession of Belhar can address us today in this country on the issue of racism. Um, because the church does yearn for the day of justice lived in hope film. Yeah. So I, I didn't grow up in the Presbyterian Church, I don't know anything about this, but the Presbyterian Church itself sort of split the Civil War, right? That's my understanding. I don't before. know. I, I, grew Methodist, <laughs> I grew up Methodist. So. <laughs> you, had, you, had the, the, you had the Southern Presbyterian Church, you had the Southern Baptist, the Southern Methodist. Yeah. Um, after the Civil War, I think in the 1880s, 1890s, there was kind of a reconciliation. And then in the 1910s and the 1920s, the fundamentalist movement, you had another break, hmm. and so now there's the PC USA right. and PC America, but that had nothing to do with the Civil War. Right. That had, I, I think the Southern Church did come into the PC USA. Yeah, yes. in, in 1986, I believe, is, oh. The, oh, okay. the, the, is right. where the current PC USA stems from. Okay. So there have been, yes, numerous divisions <laughs> and reunification. <laughs> I, 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 I was aware there were numerous divisions. Yeah. I was just wondering whether part of the reason why uh, PC USA was focusing on this was whether it was part of a attempt to unify not necessarily all Christianity, which would be awesome, but even some Presbyterian uh, efforts besides the Reformed Church of America. I don't know. Maybe that. I mean, I think there's, I mean, I feel like before I even joined the Presbyterian Church, I'd heard about some of the divisions in gay sure. marriage and various other issues. And so right. that's sort of what where my mind went to. Yeah. Um, but I, mean, I think generally just there's. The country is so divided right now. Yeah, yeah. Which I think is actually the next the next slide that I think it hits of this, which is yeah, to, this is kind of I mean I'm using quotes, but this is really why to me this confession is so compelling, is because our country is so divided right now. Um, and to me it really is very powerful, it's been very powerful over the last few weeks to kind of immerse myself in this a bit and think about what does it mean to be unified and fight for justice at the same time. Um, because I mean, my challenge, I think, is I mean, I have family who I feel like I, I love and adore, but I feel very divided on the issues of justice because I don't I don't see them fighting. I don't know if they even in their hearts disagree with some of what's happening. And so, how do you be unified with those people? Because as the confession says, it's our obligation to be unified, um, and at the same time, it's our obligation to fight for justice. And so, um, I think it's it's a really powerful statement, and I think it speaks very much to us in this time. Um, and I put up a few quotes that I found especially powerful from two of the different reflections. From There's this um, book, and we have, I think, an extra copy of it. We do, but it's at my house right now. Okay. If <laughs> <laughs> you like it, let me know. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I have um, I one which I'm happy to. I, I actually haven't quite finished it, but um, when I do, we'd we'll be happy to share. It's a really nice place. Lunch and Reflections, so 47 different reflections on different aspects of Belhar, um, starting at the beginning and going through. Um, and I, I just put a few quotes from uh, two of the ones that spoke the, mo the most to me, uh, or t among the two that spoke the most to me, um, uh, that to me tell why this is so relevant today. And so first is, we are faced with a choice, live in hate and separation or bind our wounds and love our brothers and sisters for the common good. Um, I feel like that's where, we, where we're at today. And as Christians who seek to follow in the ways of Christ, we are called to active engagement in this life, not passivity. And then from a different reflection, um, 
We, the Church of God, are called by Belhar to confess our sins of complacency and collaboration with the unjust forces at work in our nation and our world. I think we are, we're all complicit. I am complicit in many, many, many different ways. But we can also be forces for change as well. Um, and th I think that doesn't mean that we wallow in feeling bad about ourselves. <laughs> it means that we try to figure out how we can take um, that and take what power and what privilege we have and what relationships we have and what connection we have to fight this. Um, so being the church means active engagement in struggles against suffering, injustice, political policies, and ecclesi ecclesial covenants that justify discrimination of any sort against anyone. And finally, Belhar calls the church to come to know itself, to actually love the neighbor and set captives free. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, I think we just have the, what, what is coming the next three weeks. We're going to go deeper into each of these different themes. So next week, Scott Wilson is going to lead on unity. Um, March 4th, Adam Wood is going to lead on reconciliation. And March 11th, uh, Ellen Murdoch is going to lead on justice. So we're going, to, we're going to get a chance to go deeper in each of these themes. I think there's some, I mean, going through this book, there were so many things I loved that I underlined and thought I'd use and could not possibly fit into 40 minutes. So, yes, question? One of the, no, one, I just oh. want to make a statement. One of the things, you know, listening to this, I was thinking, you know, how how do we actively actively do something? You know, mm -hmm. we see all these um, the marches and the the gatherings and the very vocal things, but how does the average person deal with this? And I just think that the, to begin, you have to just really pay attention to your your vocabulary mm -hmm. and to what other people. Um, I just remember I was in Kansas at one point. And they bring people in from other countries to do their harvest. Mm. And I was talking to these two guys, and I knew that they were from Africa. And I said something about that to them, and they were very incensed and said they were not African, they were Afrikanis. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it really kind of struck me odd, but it's just those little things that we, we hear that let us know where where we are and where people we know are that yeah. we're maybe more comfortable talking to. Yeah, and I think it's about learning. It's about learning about other people and the history and, you know, a number have taken or are taking the African American Black History class right now. And I think it's also about, to me, I think the challenge too is like this unity and justice, like being connected with family and with other people and then speaking up, you know, if they say something, like from a place of being connected to them, being able to call them on whatever's happening and in a and loving way, in a connected them, way. What is that? Where, where does that come from? Yeah. You know, yeah. that challenge, you know. Yeah. Explain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, I think Adam, there's one last slide, which is just a few resources if you want. I mean, I know you're not going to have time to write down the URL, but <laughs> there were some nice resources I found um, besides this book. Um, there's this uh, online study guide. If you, you can find it um, if you, it's a PC USA resource, but it's a nice um, reflection on, on the confession. And I don't think I actually said my name. I know most of you, but I'm Angie Dickens, um, if you didn't know me. Um, and I attend second service. So um, thank you guys so much for coming. And I think we have a really nice time ahead of us next few weeks. So, thanks.